Hola, hola, amiga. In this Viva La Mami Spotlight episode, we welcome educator and mommy of three, Emily Daisy Gasca. She opens up about her experiences with parenting and talks about her approach to discipline and childhood development. Emily Daisy Gasca is the founder of the Reading Environmental Specialist. She currently serves as the MTSS lead and bilingual reading interventionist for grades K through 8 at an elementary school in Chicago. She has been an early childhood educator for over 17 years, and her passion in education has led her to begin her journey as the reading environmental specialist. Emily is now on a mission to share her framework to cultivate a reading environment that is filled with love and joy for reading. We engage in a rich discussion about effective parenting techniques and the importance of doing the work as parents. With personal experiences woven into her professional insights, Emily explores the significance of discipline for children, the need to understand and cater to different children's personalities, and how to effectively nurture and guide children based on their unique strengths and needs. In this episode, Emily touches upon her own journey with her children, especially with her second child who had certain developmental delays and how she sought early interventions and therapies to aid his improvement. We also talk about the comparison between parenting our first versus our second, and we also delve into Emily's own parenting strategies, balancing love and discipline, and how different parenting styles can actually benefit the growth and adaptability of kids. Staying mindful of one's presence and words, establishing clear communication with children, and carving out me time within the daily routine are some of the crucial tips she offers. It was an honor having her on the show, and she shares so many great tips for mamas who often struggle between different parenting techniques, whether if it's the ones that we learned from growing up or even the ones that we usually clash with, with our own partners. Here is my interview with Emily Daisy Gaska. Welcome to the Viva La Mami podcast. I am your host, Jessica Cuevas. I am a mother of two on a mission to help redefine the meaning of motherhood as a modern Latina mom. Motherhood can be a complex journey, interwoven in two identities that often make us feel ni de aquí, ni de allá. Viva La Mami is committed to providing you with knowledge, tools, and support to navigate the challenges and triumphs of motherhood as Latina moms. On the show, we'll be discussing culturally relevant topics that will help inform and empower you in whichever season you are in on your motherhood journey. We'll be joined by Latina moms, experts and professionals who can offer advice, practical tips, relatable stories, and honest conversations. So bring your cafecito as I invite you to be a part of this space as we create comunidad about the exciting and challenging parts of being a mommy. Ahora, vámonos. Hola, hola, Emily. How are you? Hello. Good morning. I'm well. Good, good. Thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you reaching out to me via DMs and that way we can have this important conversation that I've been wanting to do for such a long time especially as I am new to being a mother of two. We learn a lot from our first that oftentimes we change or modify things in our parenting with our second. And so I think that this will be such an important conversation uh, that we'll both have and hopefully mommies out there get inspired by what we have to share. And so can you talk a little bit more about yourself and tell us what you do? So I am a reading specialist. I'm a bilingual reading specialist and I am a MTSS lead and in a Chicago public school. I have been working with early childhood students for over 17 years now. My career started early on as I was still in, in school to become a teacher. And I started as an assistant. And I think that really paved the way for me as a teacher because the experience I received working in the classroom, assisting teachers, was it just really 
lay the foundation as to what our students needed and how we needed to be able to cater to their individual needs. And I met my husband when I was 12, 13 years old. We've been together, known each other since then. We got married. We've been married for 12 years this year. We have three children, Madeline, who is nine, Ulises, who is seven, and Alia, who is six months. So this is a conversation definitely I have been wanting to have and share because it so much changes, as you mentioned, from the first to the second. And especially now, as I am experiencing it with my third, it's been a few years since I last had a baby in the house and the, things just changed so drastically. Yeah. Yeah. And so can you tell us a little bit more? about like your family making the decision to have another baby. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about that, if you don't mind sharing? Yes. So my husband and I, as soon as we got married, we knew we wanted to have babies. So we tried. We've known each other for such a long time. We got married and immediately decided it was time to get started with our family. We loved kids. We love kids. And we had our two. They're exactly two years apart and a month. They were both born on the ninth of January and February. So as they got older and the kids were getting ready to go to school, we realized they're going to be leaving us, you know, so quickly. They grow up so fast. And my husband always said he wanted to have another little girl. And we just never really made that decision to try. It just happened. And it came in such a beautiful time. And she has really blessed our whole family. It's the third one we never realized we needed and she truly is a joy to have around for her siblings as well as my husband and I but it just happened and we're just so grateful to have that opportunity to be able to raise our third daughter and to see the older siblings and how their relationship is going to develop. And how was that transition especially because the two were so close in age and then there was a gap were there any kind of difficulties with that transition for the siblings specifically for the older kids yes and no it was they were so excited they were so happy to know they were going to have another sister and we tried to prepare them as soon as we told them they were we were having another baby just telling them how to be independent and showing them what they were able to do and what they're capable of doing on their own because the baby was going to demand so much time and attention, especially because I chose to breastfeed the baby. So there was going to be lots of changes. And through all of that, it really helped prepare them. So by the time that the baby came, of course, changes are difficult, even for adults when we go through transition. Mm-hmm. So it was it was challenging, but it was not anything we couldn't navigate as a family. You know, and getting through all the changes in routine and structures was what we really had to figure out. How do we navigate through this as a mother, as a father, and as children? And in the midst of all that, I think that it's important to recognize it's okay to go through our moments. It's okay to have those moments. And how do we navigate through the challenges? Because our kids are watching us. So it's been a beautiful journey to see. Mm. Thank you for sharing that. And as far as with your story with parenting, your first and your second, and now your third, can you kind of walk us through kind of like how that looks like, specifically parenting two kids that are pretty close in age, then there was a gap, and now what kind of lessons did you learn as you are parenting your third child? Yes. So first of all, I needed to... I needed to really see who my children were, their personality. Um, Between Madeline and Ulises, she was the firstborn. So we anticipated both of them in different ways. We were excited because she was the firstborn. And then when Ulises came, he was was the first boy. So they both share that special first in different ways. And Mm -hmm. what I quickly realized was that each one, not just their gender, but being different... um, just human beings. So I really had to identify who is Madeline, who is Ulises, and how can I, as a mother, pour into their strengths? How can I, as a mother, identify their love language? How can I, as a mother, be able to discipline one child in one way and discipline another child in a different way and love one child in a way that they're able to receive it? 
and not just a way that I was taught mm-hmm. or how I grew up because each of them had their own unique personalities and beautiful gifts and talents. So it was our responsibility to be able to pour into that without allowing that jealousy or sibling rivalry to come in because that was another factor too. That since they're so close in age growing up, it was easy for one to maybe get more attention than the other. And those are the pivotal moments mm-hmm. that as a mother, I had to sit back and identify what is my goal? What is my goal for Madeline? What is my goal for Ulises? How, who are they and how can I add to their strengths and allow them to be vulnerable with their weaknesses? And it's really easy for us to compare, I think, because especially when they're so close in age, and I don't think that it is intentional. It's It just comes kind of like natural. And I'm being intentional with the words that I use with my two kids because they're two years apart as well. And even if I say the little thing like, oh, well, Mateo didn't do this, but Diego did that. You know, I'm like, OK, I shouldn't say this out loud because they can feed off of that energy, even if I don't directly tell them that right about like why don't you do this like your brother or oh your brother did this why don't you do that right I think that we just need to be careful sometimes not just in the words that we use to them directly but just if we do talk about them in front of them with another adult we also need to be careful or even like our actions as well I don't know if there was something that you learned from that and now with you parenting your third that is a little different with the way that you approach things and that kind of comparison level yes so when Madeline and Lisa's were little I was in a completely different mindset and I was able to truly see that in the way that my my children were being raised and the way they were growing up and developing Lisa's hit a age where he wasn't developing the milestone and he needed to have early interventions come in and intervene and provide interventions for him to be able to speak because he wasn't speaking at the age that he was supposed to and that was an eye-opener for me but before that it actually became a crutch for me because I started to sit that's where the guilt came in and I had to sit back and think what am I going to do? How am I going to help my son? And what I did was completely dismiss the seasons of a child. You know, when kids are growing up, they need to learn what discipline truly is. Between the ages of zero and five, we talk about the discipline season, right? Where we're teaching them right from wrong. We're teaching, we're pretty much establishing that conscience for them. What's right and what's wrong. What's true and what's not. Um, between five and 12, we're training them. So because of that and i stepped back and started to be more okay go ahead you can do this or i wouldn't even make his sister go and cater to him which completely also shifted the relationship i had with my daughter so when this challenge arose it came in a rush and because it came in a rush into our family i didn't know how to handle it so what i did was the wrong things to do, right? And I was able to sit and reflect on that because when he started reaching his milestones and he started to grow and develop, I was able to see my son is so capable, but now I became a crutch where the way I was parenting, my style became a hindrance. So what am I going to do now? Well, I have to fix it. And when I started to see what needed to be done to lead Ulises on the path that he needed to be, it, it was all it all went back to the root of discipline and showing him and allowing him to see, no, I'm disciplining you because it's good for you. You know, I love you, but I'm going to show you right from wrong. If mom says no, it's no. If your sister says no, it's no. We have to respect mm. yes and no. Mm. So now that I have Aliyah, I'm starting since she's little. You know, she starts mm. to grab things. Um, she's in the stage where she's grabbing everything and trying to put it in her mouth. And just allowing my words to resonate with her as I share, you know, no, this is not okay. No, Alia, don't put this in your mouth. Or no, Alia, this is not food. No. So just explaining to her what no means 
or we do not eat mm-hmm. mom's hair. We do not put this mm-hmm. in <laughs> their mm-hmm. mouth, you know, in your mouth. So it's just identifying the how and the why and explaining to them since they're born. I think that I failed to do that with my other two because I just thought, oh, they're human beings, they're little, they don't understand. I had no idea how the brain truly developed. And that's Mm. because of what I experienced with Ulysses, that opened the door to me really looking and researching more about the brain, more about those early years. How How do their brains develop? So there's the positivity in everything that we face as mothers. But we can't allow the guilt and the regret to set in because then we put ourselves in a box. And I had I went through that phase, but I quickly said no, because I had to pull myself out of it. I had to acknowledge this is not going to get my son and my family and I anywhere positive. So allowing to really do some research what do you do in the classroom how do you help struggling students to read how do you help kids who are having a hard time regulate their emotions it was learning how to apply what I learned to be how to be an educator a teacher at my house in a loving way yes yes that is also interesting that you mentioned and I think we're going to break that down because you gave so much and As you were talking about this, first of all, with saying, you know, just like the importance of early childhood development, I think that in our culture, we oftentimes don't really know unless we learn (laughs) about early childhood development. Because the way that I was taught about kids and babies, it's like, ah, no saben, oh, van a aprender. You know, eventually a miracle is kind of going to happen and all of a sudden they're going to adapt to our ways. And even though, yes, as human beings, we are social, you know, we're social individuals, we will adapt. You know, babies are very resilient. They are adaptable. But when it really comes to understanding the psyche of babies and growing children, I think that it is so important to understand where they are at, if they are achieving any milestones and how we can help, whether if it's through interventions or therapies to better, you know, help them in their development. And as much as like people are really, I think they want to avoid even the word therapy. (laughs) I'm like, it helps. Yes. (laughs) You know, whether if it's speech therapy, occupational therapy, you know, all of the different therapies that are available, they are there and they exist for a reason. And they're not necessarily there for adults, right? Like there are specific therapies for children as well. And if our gut tells us, you know, something is off, then we need to find ways to seek professional help. And so I appreciate you sharing that about your son, Ulises, who you noticed that there was some kind of delay. And then you started to reflect and think, okay, what are ways in which I can better support him? And then through that, or even like in general, even when you decide to be a parent, like, I think it's important to just research and not depend so much on what our family says. And I think that oftentimes as Latinas, we really depend on that, right? We really... um kind of like instead of seeking professional advice we only look upon our parents advice that the, what the tia say yeah. you know what las comadres say and yes even though this is helpful because you're getting anecdotal information about their lived experiences each and every person is different our babies are going to be different and the way that we will parent will be much different and so you are an educator can you share kind of like the importance of early childhood development and what kind of like you learned from that in your own research to dismantle kind of like those myths that oftentimes we were taught growing up about, you know, early childhood development? Yes, this is a great question. So our brain develops, 80% is developed by the age of five. That means that language, and language is a first to develop. Language is what the brain is, how it communicates, how we communicate, and how we're able to process. So as I was looking to see, okay, well, how is my son 
how can I help support him in his speech? How can I help support him in understanding and comprehending? And it's amazing because I was able to see how he wouldn't speak. He wouldn't um, repeat words. Yet I always noticed that he was very observant. He, and he was always listening. So as he was listening and looking and the things that we would say, the things that he would do or his sister would do, and then when the therapist would come or when we would take him to therapists outside as well, we did both early interventions and then we were also taking him to outside um, private therapists. He, everybody would just say, you know, he's learning to focus. He's learning to understand. And the, it just didn't really make sense to me. I'm like, okay, so he's very observant. He's, he's able to hear, to listen. But why isn't he making that connection? And it all goes back to his personality. He, he's very reserved. And I was able to see that once he started to speak. And now that he's seven, everything that we poured into, that the therapist poured into him, just allowed him to truly develop in, in, in ways that I didn't know were possible. So in, in finding research and looking at all the information about our brain and how our language develops and how kids are, if they're able to think about it, they're able to speak it, then they're able to read it and write it. So he wasn't speaking, but then all of a sudden he started to speak. And I always read to them. So I think that was another component. Being an educator, I knew reading to your child every day is going to really add to their vocabulary. So I was reading to them every night. And as he got older and started to talk, and in, it was when he was about four years old, when he finally started to speak and the vocabulary he was using was just blowing my mind. Like all of the interventions, everything that we did was truly, he was just soaking it in. It was his way of expressing his personality. And now that he is in second grade, he is reading and comprehending at levels beyond his his grade, which is great. So yes, he was able to, we were able to close that gap. But again, it was because of all the interventions and the research and not giving up. Like you said, mm. we went and we took him, we would take him every Saturday to different um, therapists. He was going to OT, he was going to speech. Then we would go every week, once a week, we took him to swimming to help with his fine motor skills. And all of that allowed him to just truly be free and to know that you know we're fighting for him i think that that was a part as well that sometimes we it goes unnoticed you know the sacrifices that we make as parents our kids know our kids mm -hmm. it comes to a point where they able they are able to realize mm -hmm. everything that we did was for their good and to benefit them and i i want to touch on the discipline season because it really affected my incoming students in ways that I didn't understand. It was, I was facing the same things at home with my son, and then I was facing it in the classroom. I had a very unique group that year when my son was five, and it was probably half the class who had a either language delay, they were not speaking, they could not ask for simple I'm like, I want to use the bathroom or can I use the bathroom? They just, they couldn't verbalize that. Their language, every year I noticed um, being in a kindergarten classroom, their language and vocabulary was less. And I started to think, how can we close this gap? I want my students to be able to ask for their basic needs. And it was just having those conversations with parents and just sharing with them. Like, if I... If you call your child's name, are they able to turn around and look at you and have you, you know, you have their full attention? And parents would say no. And I would look at them and tell them, well, this is a very critical life skill because mm -hmm. if somebody is trying to get to their attention, they should be able to stop and look and say, yes, you know, yes, yes, Mrs. Gaska, yes, mom. Mm -hmm. What were to happen if your child is just walking and all of a sudden she comes to the street and you're calling her name to tell her to stop? Or you're calling his name to say stop, right? Like Ulises, stop. But because Ulises is not trained and doesn't have the discipline to stop because he heard his name, he's going to keep walking. And what happens if a car's coming? So I had to picture, like, paint this picture for parents to be able to see your child's 
development and allowing them to fully understand what is yes and what is no is a life skill that it's a foundational life skill for the rest of their lives. So, and just sharing with them how you need to explain to them. Children are little people. They have the right to understand why is that a no? They have that right. And we should explain to them why. Well, it's no because if you continue to do this, then it can lead to this. There's consequences to your choices. And I think that it takes practice uh, because the way that we were taught in parenting with disciplining, it's con la chancla yep. or, you know, or just screaming, yelling or threatening. And sometimes we need to unlearn those traditional parenting styles that we were taught to then focus on, okay, if I still want to discipline, because disciplining is good. I mean, and it is essential. It is important, like you said, about that analogy with stopping. Oh, si no, you know, te wanna, you know you're going to get hit. I think that it is very crucial, like how you mentioned and shared that we can start as early as they are babies. And I love that you shared that with your little one, how, you know, you are setting specific boundaries for her. You know, even when she's like pulling your hair and you're saying no. And I think that there is a different approach in disciplining. And I often think about the way that we are currently struggling with our toddler. He is just so strong willed. He is like, it's my way or the highway sort of thing. And it is so hard to keep repeating no means no without threatening. And sometimes se me pasa, right? Se me, se me sale las palabras. Well, if you're not going to do this, then we're not going to do that. And I'm like, oh, I hate this. Like, why am I being my mom? <laughs> yeah. You know? And it is so hard. So do you have any like tips with a super resilient child, especially who are in that toddler age or even older children too, like kids who are, you know, your older children's ages, like how can we approach if we really don't want to utilize the way that we were parented? What are some kind of like gentler discipline ways that we can implement that in our parenting? That's a great question. It's really important. It, it all goes back to the communication and allowing them to think, okay, some, because the resistance is coming from feeling threatened to not have control. That's one of the things I learned about the brain. Our brain will, it's just naturally, it wants to be in control, especially at that age when they understand, right? That's why they call it the terrible twos or the toddler years are because they're identifying who they are and they're discovering like, I can do things on my own. I don't have to depend on mom or dad or somebody. So as they're trying to identify who they are, their personality, what can they get away with? What can they not get away with? It's important to, to word it or reframe it in a way where they feel like they have choices. So I know we've been using the word no, and it's really important not to use it so much with our kids. So what's mm -hmm. another word for no? Like, Uli says, si no haces la tarea, no vas a tener los grados que tú quieres. O no vas a aprender lo que... So it's helping him or her be in control. It's showing them, okay, ahorita es tiempo de comer. So we're going to sit down as a family and we're going to eat. We can play after or we can play mm -hmm. tomorrow. Like giving them choices. It's your choice. It's six o'clock. It's dinner time. You want to play. I understand that. But we have dinner time. So we have to respect the time. That's part of our routine. That's mm -hmm. part of our schedule. So now you have a choice. So Lee says, you can play after dinner. Or we can play tomorrow morning. Or if we go through the, like, and just allow them to see, I have choices. And they might get upset right. because it's going to take time for them to reframe the, the way that they respond. But mm. I think that one of the keys to parenting and discipline is the consistency. Because kids, the moment they lose our trust, the moment that we say no, but then we do it anyways, or we allow it. Their brain is so smart that they're like, oh, you're going to get away with it. You're, it's okay. She's just, just bluffing. <laughs> so they know. And it's interesting, you know, it's kind of going back to that analogy con 
you know, la chancla, which I hate, right? I hate that. But I do remember when my mom would threaten it. Well, not necessarily. Just in general, right? right? Yes. Like, oftentimes we were threatened, mm -hmm. right? It's like, si no lo vas a hacer, te voy a pegar con la chancla, o te voy a pegar. And it's like, okay, well, I'm going to do it because last time they didn't hit me. And I remember, <laughs> you know, being so rebellious and it makes sense, right? It's going back to that analogy, but I don't want to use that as an example too. <laughs> but it is true, right? Like sometimes we took advantage of that little threat when in general, like they didn't even do anything and we just took advantage of that opportunity. So I think that is so critical. And thank you so much for sharing that because... Yeah, like I think that we need to understand how powerful their little brains are. Mm -hmm. And again, going back to understanding milestones, right? Understanding early childhood development. And I don't know, in your research and in you kind of relearning a lot about how to discipline your children or even how to understand where they're at, are there any resources or books that you read that you can share to our listeners? About that? I will say, you know, the first thing I did when I'm trying to learn something new, this is just something I, as an adult, I'll just share as a tip. I look up the word and I and defined it. So mm -hmm. when I started to see, okay, what does discipline mean? Because like you said, I learned discipline as in getting beat with the chancla, getting hit with the belt. That was a discipline, but that's not discipline, right? So when I looked it up, it, it's, it, discipline is to train, it corrects. It, di disciplining a child is going to mold who they are. It perfects their mental faculties and their moral character. So the goal is, as we're disciplining them, I am kind of molding their character. Who do I want my son and daughter to be? Do I want them to be honest, be virtuous, be bold, confident, courageous? Um, to be loving, kind, or do I want them to lash out, freak out, or debate? You know, so it helped me identify what is a, to, what does it mean to discipline? Once I reframed my brain as what that means, then I was able to see, okay, what is not discipline? It's creating excuses. And then I was able to see, I have to balance love and I have to balance discipline. Mm -hmm. And because if, we give too much love, right? We, we cater to them. We allow them to get their way, whatever they do, whatever they want. Even if I said no and they continue to do it, then that's going to spoil the child. And what am I going to yeah. send out to society, right? When their boss is, like, I had to think about it this way and paint this picture in my head. If their boss says, I need this at this time, this is a deadline, but they don't do it because, you know, they always got away with things, that could lead to them being fired. And then I had to learn how to not so not just discipline everything. No, you can't do this. You can't do that. You know, it, it needed to be balanced. So they know I love you. And because I love you and I will tell them because I love you, I'm telling you, you can't do that because I love you. And I'm, it's my job to keep you secure and protect you. Now that they're older, I will explain it to them in that way. And so that's what I did. I looked up what are the different love languages? And I was on a search mm -hmm. to really identify, okay, what is Ulisa's love language? What is Madeline's love language? It's completely different. So my approach to loving them is different. And it kind of closes mm -hmm. that door to creating that rival rivalry and jealousy because it allows them to feel loved, right? Because when we're, if we have a certain love language, we have to receive it in that way for our body to, true, our brain to receive it. And... Um, identifying it and knowing what they need in that season because it can change as they grow as well. Um, so I think that those are the things that I would like to share. And another thing I started to do, I started to read the Bible. Like, you know, you see so many proverbs about raise a child or train a child in the way that they should go. And when they're old, they're going to, I don't know it exactly, but I just kept saying that in the back of my head. If I train my children, and I start to do the right thing. It was as if I was honestly growing with my children because what I saw them doing was a reflection of what all that internal stuff that I had suppressed from my childhood. That's why mm. I acted the way I acted. That's why I lashed out. And I would think, how can I be so calm in the classroom, but at home, any little thing would just trigger me. 
Like that didn't make mm. sense to me. And that's when I was just searching why I love my kids, mm -hmm. right? But because of how I grew up and the way I was disciplined, it's just not, it doesn't, it, what culture does is not acceptable in this hour right now in the way our, we need to raise our children. There's so much out there. Mm -hmm. So I had to really identify, what am I going to cultivate within my kids? Yes. Yes, that is so powerful. And I'm, yeah, I'm sure for you, it was like spiritual healing as well, which is great. Yeah. And I think we definitely need to reflect and think, okay, how do I want to present myself in front of my children? What is my philosophy, my own parenting philosophy? And does my philosophy coincide with my partners as well? Because that in itself is different. You know, yeah. if two partners have these different philosophies or different ways of parenting and things clash, you know, that in itself is very difficult to navigate. And the way that I thought was like, well, both parents need to be on the same page. But and even doing my own research, and even with my uh, toddler's teacher in play school, I told her like, oh, you know, my husband does this and I do that. And whenever Diego would kind of be very touchy and grabby and she's like, you know what? It's good that you both have different parenting styles because when they grow up, they're going to grow up with different teachers yes. and these teachers will have different teaching styles as mm -hmm. well. And so with kids, they need to navigate all of these different approaches to ensure that they are essentially doing what they have to do, right? In the way that they are being disciplined. My own like parenting philosophy and my partners, like how can we both get into this compromise, mm -hmm. if you will, to ensure that our kids are being successful? I don't know if you have any thoughts about that. I do. And I love that you brought this up because it is so important. That is definitely the same in my household. My husband had has a different belief and approach than I do. My husband's more firm. He's more direct. And I was always more like laid back and passive. I'm going to be very honest. Mm -hmm. And I think that that in the midst of identifying what our parenting style and what works best for our kids, we both had to unconsciously we both had to balance it out we both had to mm -hmm. I don't want to say compromise because it was being able to like okay understand the way he his firmness is needed in a certain season the way my my gentle approach not the passivity because that's never acceptable mm -hmm. that's where I had to reframe my mindset and my belief so I love the fact that my husband had a different mindset because if he would have came from the same, we wouldn't be where we are today. Yeah. And like you said, yeah. they are going to experience different types of personalities, different types of leadership in their life. And if they mm -hmm. don't know how to identify that firm tone, um, those boundaries, yet there's also some who are gentle, if they're not able to see the difference or they start to take things personally that's going to crush them so it is important to be able to know sometimes you know having a loud voice is not a bad thing especially in our cultura so many people like that's natural we speak loud and some yeah. of us are more gentle and some spoken yeah yeah <laughs> that is so true <laughs> oh i love this yes thank you for sharing that for the mamas that are here who are listening Considering that you are a mom of three, like what is your routine in making sure that you are fully present in your day to day life that that you go through in, in your motherhood journey? Yes, this is a great question because it can be difficult balancing everything. Like we are moms, mm -hmm. we are wives, we are human beings. We deserve to have fun. We need to be poured into. And it it's about finding the balance between what do I need in this moment? So having a routine is very important. I make sure that every day I read to just read the, read, read the Bible, read a scripture. And then I go into journaling and I look at certain words. I love identifying words. That's just the teacher in me, that natural learner in me. So I will look up a word. What does this word need? 
and then I will look it up, I will write it out, and then I will just write my thoughts and I just journal, just write, what am I feeling in that hour? What do I need in this hour? I'm also very intentional about um, what I enjoy, like I love, so every day I will just wake up, I will get ready after I read the Bible and I will put on my makeup. That makes me happy. So I do this every day. Then um, making sure that I'm very conscious of getting some physical activity in however way that looks throughout the day, just 10 minutes. So a typical day in, in the life, right, of Emily would be wake up, read the Bible, get dressed. And I also love to hear like podcasts, things that bring positivity into my life and very mindful about what I see and what I hear. So making sure that I listen to something and sometimes it's just music. I need that music to just, you know, and the drive to school to take the kids to school. And then before bed, again, what didn't I accomplish today or what do I need or what do I need to do? Writing down my to-do list. That's another thing that has really been very helpful. What do I need to do? We can get in the, into the hole of, be, you know, just all those mundane tasks that mm -hmm. we always put ourselves back. Like, oh, I'll do it tomorrow. No, I'll do it next week. So just laying out the month this month. Do I want to get my nails done? Do I want to do my hair? Do I want to go to the park and walk? Do I want to go out to have, have lunch with my friends? Being very intentional and planning what do I need in order for me to be able to feel fresh and the joy that I need to show up for my family. Yeah. Because if we're not showing up for ourselves, we cannot show up for them. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love this. I am taking so many great tips from you. Uh, because I'll be frank with you, you know, we're in this full survival mode. We are in a current living situation. We're living temporarily with my parents at my parents' house because we're waiting for us to move to the city in our home. But it is currently being remodeled. And yeah, navigating motherhood as well, you know, making sure that our kids are being fed, that they are dressed, that they are involved and doing activities. You know, it just takes so much. But I think that by you sharing these tips, you know, and taking a couple steps back and really being intentional of your presence as mamas, I think that is so important because again, we want to model the way for our children and in a positive way, right? Instead of seeing the angry side or, you know, the rage that oftentimes can be triggering for many kids. And so I think that is very important. So thank you for sharing that. Well, now we're going to shift gear and ask you a Viva La Mami Motherhood questions that I ask my guests at the end of our interviews. And so the first question I have for you is, what is your meaning of motherhood? Uh, my meaning of motherhood is showing up for these tiny human beings that we have been entrusted with and pouring into them, right? Identifying their strengths and helping them be successful. What is it that they need in order to achieve their purpose on this earth? Oh, I love it. And second question, what is one tip of advice you have for Latina mommies? Oh my goodness. I think that I would share, you know, you mentioned being intentional with your words and that this is one of the things that I worked on and I'm working on to reframe my language is be speak what you want to see because our words are going to shape our tomorrow our words when we release them into the atmosphere they're there forever so what you want to see in your kids once you identify what their purpose is and what their strengths are speak into that and just be very intentional and consistent even though if you see your child is having a tantrum or you know is testing you because they are that's part of human beings right that's the way the brain is wired so stand firm on that no but I know you were born for greatness I know you are mm -hmm. gentle that's in you I know you are loving you may be angry but I know you're that passion that anger is fueled from let's find a way to let it come out in a loving way rather than an angry passionate way mm -hmm. so that's what I would say oh I love that. Thank you so much for being here. Where can people follow you? So I'm on Instagram. It is Emily Daisy Gasca. I am also on Facebook. I'm not as um, active on Facebook, but I'm learning. I am expanding. I am on LinkedIn as well. Emily Daisy Gasca. 
Um, but definitely follow because I do want to share. I have so much. I'm so passionate about helping other women, um, moms, mamas, and as well as educators. Um, today we talked. Yeah. I had my mom roll on today, but it's a balance, and I just I'm just so passionate to help other women just be empowered. You are amazing. We are amazing. And everything that your children need or your students is already within you. And I want to ignite that. I want to, to help other women feel empowered and know that, you know, let's dismantle that guilt. Let's remove it because that shame that, you know, we grew up with or that we were um, taught to always go to or think because, no, you've got so much inside of you. Let's just pull it out. So, yes. Yes. Oh, I love it. Well, thank you so much, Emily, for being here. I really appreciate it. These are fantastic tips that many mamas will be able to take. And they're all realistic, I think. If we spend 10 minutes of our day and build a little routine that will help us in the long run, like in the long run, it's all about self-care, self-love, and self-compassion. And what you provided here is just amazing. So thank you again for being here. I'll make sure to share all of your contact information in the show notes and that way people can follow you as well. Thank you so much. It was just a whole beautiful morning spent with you. And thank you. Thank you for this opportunity thank to be you. able to share. Thank you for tuning in to the Viva La Mami podcast. If you like this episode, make sure to leave a review and write what episode really resonated with you. If you really loved it, share it on social media or with an amiga. As always, please subscribe to this podcast wherever you are listening. Make sure to follow me at Viva La Mami on Instagram or visit vivalamami.com. Please note the information shared in this podcast is for educational purposes only and should not be replaced by your healthcare provider nor taken as professional advice. <laughs>